Hello and welcome to Driven by Doing podcast. Today we have Gad Allen. Gad, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Great to have you to be here. So, Gad is a professor of operations, information, and decisions at Wharton School of Business, and also he's the director of Jerome Fisher Program in Management and Technology. I was I had the pleasure of taking uh, Gad's class not very long ago uh, during this summer uh, in my program at Penn. And today, I'm very glad that I was able to speak with you, Gad, uh, on my podcast. So going, back to, yeah. so going back to your story, like you did your bachelor's and master's back in Israel. So let's go back to your, uh, those days and let's begin from there. And do, like, do you always had this passion for education back then? Or is it something that you learned over years, uh, years of your experience? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think I, I started with that passion so much. In fact, from a very young age, I was a software developer. I worked very early, self-taught, but worked very early with fairly big organizations. But decided very early that that's not what I want to do for the rest of my life. In fact, I was very interested in, in systems and big systems and, and thinking through a, so being engineered, but, but thinking more a, on, on econ a, economics and systems and things like that, complex systems, a, and, and decided to study operations research a, and, and really enjoyed the research part and enjoyed kind of dealing with probability and stochastic processes. A, but in fact, a, was really more interested, start being uh, more interested in, in, in teaching uh, during my military service where, where I had the opportunity to, to be an officer. And, and I love that you, you realized one of the things that you enjoy the most is, is on one side being very rigorous in what you do, but at the same time, uh, the ability to, to educate others, to impact others uh, through demonstrating things, teaching and, and mentoring. And so once I, I, I completed my service, I decided to do my PhD. And, and when you decide to do a PhD, usually teaching is not the main reason. Um, but in many ways, you think about life in academia and, and, and career in academia. And, and usually it means research, but also I, I definitely looked forward to the ability to educate and, and, and mentor people. Mm -hmm. And then once you decided to get your PhD and now that you had this passion for research and since your experience uh, in, the, uh, in the military or like now you served your nation and then you came to Colombia here at the United States. So do you always wanted to come here to the United States back then? It's a good question. Um, not so much, I don't think that's how it started. It was more, um, but, but I knew I, after I, I finished my undergrad and, and started my master's, I realized that I want to do a PhD and, and basically everybody I spoke with recommended coming here. In, in Israel, at least most uh, faculty, uh, maybe not most, but uh, to a high fraction uh, were educated in the US. So it was almost like, it was just an obvious choice. It was really not even a choice. It was very clear that if I want, even if I want to go back to Israel and, and be in academia in Israel, I, I need to come to do my PhD here. So I, I explored multiple places. Uh, most, of, most of my faculty uh, were educated here. So in that sense, I think it, it was a fairly informed decision. Uh, and, and I already had, uh, I was married and, and my, uh, my, my son was born just before I came to the US. So, so I knew already that I want to be also in a city. And, and in that sense, I think Colombia was a great place. I, I had an amazing advisor, amazing mentors there, uh, but also being in a city actually was helpful as well. So once you completed your PhD and then you went on to work at uh, Northwestern. So that was your first opportunity coming out of uh, like your PhD program. And then you taught for several years there. What was your experience uh, once getting out of college and starting your uh, teaching career? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. I think it, it's to some extent, um, I, I, I think that at, at Columbia, I learned how to be a researcher. Uh, so I uh, really amazing uh, mentors um, you develop both methods and taste. Uh, but at, at Kellogg in many ways, I learned how to be a, an educator uh, because on one side, I, I continue to do research and was very much devoted to research. But at the same time, for the first time, in fact, you, you have uh, students, uh, you, you teach students, right? I mean, like in, in your PhD, you don't really teach so much UTA. 
um, and and you learn you start and a little bit you know in in some areas like in, in baseball for example there is a minor league before you get into the big leagues um, and in many areas there is like a place where you practice before you go to a, a, to play in real time a, in prime time a, and in the MBA world in business in business school world there isn't such a, a place to, to practice throwing a, a softballs a, so you get immediately into a class of, of, of MBA students that are looking for extremely high quality a, and so I experimented with many many things a, and 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 and, and learned that, first of all, I, I enjoy doing that. I, I, I learned that I get good feedback from the students. And, and so that overall, um, I, I did it well. Um, but, but you shape yourself as, as, a, as a faculty. Like, like, what type of faculty are you? Are you more in terms like, do, how do you, like, I, one of the best experiences that I had, in fact, in, in, in Israel still, um, I, so I, I went to, in Israel to the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology. It's a very, very technical university. It's the equivalent of, let's say, MIT or Caltech in the US. Um, and, but when I was a TA there, we they did one day training for us as TAs because they couldn't force faculty to do that. So only TAs had that. And rather than bringing other teachers to do that, they brought a, a theater director to do that. Um, and, and his main point was that if you cannot be extremely enthusiastic of what you teach and extremely passionate for what you teach, how can you expect your students to be? Uh, that you really need in everything you do to express your enthusiasm for what you teach. And if you cannot express your enthusiasm, either, either find a way to be enthusiastic about that, so go deeper, learn deeper, or move to teach something else. Uh, and and that's to some extent was really when I came to Kellogg. That was one of the biggest realization, or that, that that's or at least was an opportunity to play with that and, and to to refine the way I think about things in in, in terms of uh, teaching and education. So I, I was there for eleven years, um, and and it was a great place to develop. I uh, got a lot of support from the school to try things. Really got a lot of great feedback from the students, um, and and I, the way I teach to this day is very much things that I've done there. That's awesome, Gad. Uh, I know, like, you know, a lot of friends uh, have really enjoyed you uh, taking all the classes uh, from you. And uh, I actually asked one of, uh, like, you know, my friend uh, from my class, like, I'm talking with Gad. Like, what question uh, do you have for Gad? And she asked, like, Hey, like, you might want to ask Gad, like, what is his favorite Israeli street food? Uh, <laughs> so that's the question I got. So if you don't mind uh, sharing that, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a hard question. I, I'm a you know, as an Israeli, I probably need to say, well, so Israel is interesting in a sense that most of our, our street food is actually, Israel is a melting pot. It's a melting pot of, a, I'll give an example. My parents were born in Israel, but my grandparents were born in Germany, Poland, and Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife's parents were born in Iran. So, and, and so like when you look at Israeli street food, it's a combination of Lebanese, Syrian, Egyptian, Moroccan, a little bit of a Eastern European. Um, so for me, it's, it's shawarma and, 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 and hummus is, is really the, the main, but these are not, I mean, for outside of Israel, they're not known as Israeli food, they're known as Mediterranean food, Lebanese food maybe. Uh, but I, I, I'm, when I go to Israel, I try to have as much hummus as I can. Um, just because the quality is much better than the US. Probably there is better quality in other countries, in Lebanon or in Egypt or, or in, in Syria. Uh, but for me, at least, the ability going to Israel, that is really the, uh, the, the, the shortages of things that I try to fulfill compared to here. That's awesome, I guess. So do you, do you go uh, to Israel uh, like quite often, once in a while? So, um, you know, now with COVID-19, I don't, I cannot go all that often, but I, I try to go once a year, at least, uh, sometimes more than once a year. Uh, for a while, I had a, a, a I was a co-founder of, of a startup in the area of, techn of educational technology, in fact, uh, where, where the R&D and, and where it was in Israel, and then I was based in the US together with the, the sales team. Um, and then in that situation, I went back more often, but I try to go at least with the family uh, at least once a year. Uh, my parents are there, my, my parents-in-law are there, my brothers are there, brother-in-law, sister-in-law. So I think we try to go often also for the kids to be able to speak the language and, and meet their parents, their grandparents. 
That's great. So now transitioning into your uh, your entrepreneurial journey, like tell us a little bit more about your startup, like you no know, fur class. I think uh, like you, know, you started uh, quite uh, some years ago, and yeah. how did you come up with this idea? Now you started experimenting with a lot of your students at uh, Kellogg, and then like did that spark that idea? Yeah. So, so to some extent, it started from an experience where I, a part of my research, I developed a simulation game. A, that was really not related, was very much specific. It was a, a simulation game on how to run a supply chain. And it worked really, really well because it was an hour of game. I had an amazing dashboard that allowed me to decide to see how everybody did. And the class would run itself because I would come and say, a Venki, you did this and this and that. Can you explain? I will go to someone else who will say, John, you did that, that. Can you explain? Here's a dashboard. And my only goal there would be a facilitator. And I said, well, if, it would be amazing if we have something like that in every class. Now, I think simulations cannot, some people run simulation in every session or a whole course. I don't think simulation can run an entire course. But I think that there are many elements from that. The element that I really like from that, that I, when I abstract from that, was the ability to go and rather than ask a student what they think, know what topic I want to highlight and then finding the students to be able to elevate that. So what Forklass did was very simple. It actually, uh, I would usually ask when I pitch it later on to faculty, I ask them four questions. I ask them, are you assigning any content? And the faculty will say, yes. Are you assigning any questions on this content? All of them will say yes. Most of them, 99% will say I assign questions. And then I ask them a simple question. Are, are you satisfied with the level of knowledge that this level of preparation that the students bring to the class? And then the faculty will be immediately say no. Maybe 10% will read it. And, and maybe 20%, maybe 20% will read, but 10% understood it and went deep enough. So absolutely not interested. I, I one faculty told me I left the class today in disgust from, from how, a, a lack of, how not prepared they were. But then I asked them one more question, which I think was really you know, my, my prerogative as a faculty or privilege as a faculty, if you will. I asked them, as the faculty, are you satisfied with your level of preparation? Not in terms of the content, because most of us are really, really prepared, but in terms of knowing what students know what. So you can actually bring the right student at the right time. And so what the tool did was it just assigned simple questions like you have in Canvas, you have in many things, but what was really the main engine behind that, and that's kind of where I think was my insight as a faculty, it had a simple dashboard that allowed you to look at the answer and click at the answer and see the students that actually provided that. And both for numerical and for textual. It allowed you also to, type, to, to run statistical analysis to say, I want someone that gave this answer for this question, this answer for this question, but also use these type of terms. And so what it allowed to do, it allowed to identify in every class, the five, six students that will elevate a discussion and allow you to build a plan that's now become much more predictable and much more effective than what you have in the, in usual, when you go to a class and you have 30 students in front of you, 60 students in front of you, and, and you're asking a random student a question and that student might actually have the right answer that you wanted them to have. When I say right, I mean this, the right student at the right time, but they actually might give you an answer that is too advanced to this stage. And, and in fact, they, they are so advanced that the entire class is left behind. Or they actually may take you to a tangent that now you need to spend 10 minutes just rescuing the entire class and bringing that back to, that, to where they want. Like this notion of improvising in class is nice, but they might, Rather, I, I would like to improvise in a situation where I know where, where my limits are and where I can go, and I know what students will actually bring the discussion. So the main impact was when we, we scaled it from one university to 100 universities within a year, and the main feedback was students come better prepared. More people participate than usual because you can now, it's not you're going to the same people again and again. International students felt much more comfortable participating because they, they knew that they're called. It's not called calling, they, they're called based on what they said. And overall, when we had like A-B testing, the performance also was higher. So it sounds like a very simple tool, but it's very much unlike flashy technology, that was very much a pedagogical technology. Right? There was a pedagogy behind that that said, people, if you do high frequency, a non-consequential testing, when it's nest testing in, in a very, and I don't mean testing, I mean like questioning, you will get people to think about things deeper, you will get them to participate and overall 
there is much of a process of learning that happens in the classroom. That's just uh, amazing uh, insight uh, that you got, uh, Gad. And then, like, you started researching and did your customer discovery, talking to like the students. You are already seeing that. Uh, that's how you got that insight. And now, now you build this product. And sometimes, like, no, you're an educational entrepreneur. Uh, in fact, like, you build this product now. Like many many students and uh, teachers might be using it uh, already. So now, now looking at the product back, like, what do you think worked? in favor of that insight and what else did you learn once people started using that product? Right, so I, I think the main thing was very much being very clear on a, you know, what worked well, we had some set of features that worked really well. What doesn't work well is in education, you have a, a separation between decision maker and usages. Mm. Right, you have the CIOs of the university that you no, know, I'll say most of them are not into pedagogy. That's not their priority. And we did not prioritize the CIO of the university. So if you ask me what was really the main mistake was that we always, being a faculty myself, we went from the bottom up. And so we didn't really work that well on, on reporting tools and integration. We worked in the region, but it was not really the core of what we did. What worked really well for us is that we really understood the faculty. Like faculty, when faculty, and we all, I should say one thing, we also didn't do that well. We didn't really, so we didn't care about the students, but most of the work was around the faculty on making sure the faculty have a very simple tool, that the grading is integrated, that, that we made sure the students are protected, but it never really looked all that great from the student point of view. For the faculty, that was really, the, the point was to prioritize that. Primarily with the idea that if we want to push better learning, we want to reduce the time for faculty, reduce the effort for faculty, and improve their ability to create value. Um, so I would say whenever you have limited resources and a startup, you always have limited resources. We chose to prioritize that. Clearly, potentially building better tools for CIOs and potentially improving the student experience could have done, got, taken that multiple step forward. I, I definitely see that again, because one of the, the same experiences that I had building my own uh, ed tech startup is that again, like you know, not knowing about ed tech entrepreneurship or like you know, how the ed tech startups work, like you always start from like the you know, student pain points and like the you know, student things, but like, you no, know, if you look at like, who is going to be the, the payer or like, you know, whom should you sell the product? It's always like top down and like, having to realize that it took a lot of time and like we almost like burned a lot of cash in order to identify that the the pain point and now especially sometimes you need to convince like a lot of stakeholders in order to like you know, really get that product so sometimes it is, it is going to be super difficult and uh, that's one of the challenges especially for tech entrepreneurs and right. in those cases what would you suggest at tech entrepreneurs uh, like us to, to really think through that, like, you know, who is that end user and like how to go about, like, once you build the product, once you get that initial traction to really scale, like, you know, that's, that's one, one of your research areas, like scaling applications. Right. I mean, I think in, in education, there are, I would say it's a good question. I think, I think there are, in education, there are multiple stakeholders and, and that's of I think the, the difficulty here, right? I mean, even on one side, the CIOs of the universities, um, that are, are have very specific uh, interest in the very a, a relatively high sensitivity to to risk so they don't like taking risks but they do sit that if you want to scale within a university you need them as your ally you, they need faculty so you do need to work with faculty so it's like you need to work both sides at the same time in edtech there is more and more a, a VCs that say that they don't invest in anything that's about more technology for the university, what they want or, or the school, they want directly to go directly to the, the students, to the parents. A, a, and these are, are, are th these are usually more scalable in a sense that, I mean, I think then you don't have to go through these bottlenecks that, that like university that, or your school that makes a decision only that often. So I, I would say, this is actually an example, I think EdTech is, is an example where it's not always that the best product win. Um, and then what we see is many suboptimal uh, decision making that ultimately result in the fact that we use product that are, are clearly suboptimal and clearly not, not good. I mean, if you look at the, the LMS market, the learning management system market, 
Uh, Blackboard was dominating this market for many, many years, uh, even though the product was absolutely stale. And the reason for that is that they learned that the best investment for them is not in improving the product, but actually on improving their relationship with the CIOs. So they wine and dine the, the CIOs in, in, in the many conferences. And I'm not claiming for a corruption, of course, but what I'm saying here is that universities, I mean, they knew that they're better off lobbying and maintaining good relationship with the decision makers than investing in improving their product. And, and, and that's unfortunate, but that's to, to some extent a when you have, and then Canvas came and disrupted that and, and, and offered the ability for faculty to, to start their own product a class on Canvas without the need to have the entire university. But if you look at Canvas now, it has not improved. I, I've been using Canvas by now, a, a, I don't say a decade, but probably close to a decade. Mm -hmm. a, and, and the first few years I was extremely excited and it's hard to be excited about an LMS, but, I, but in the last few years, it's, it's again, very much a stale product. Uh, and, and I'm sure, I don't know where their investment is going, but it's definitely not an improving their product. Mm -hmm. uh, and then so the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad reality, but that's to some extent a little bit the equilibrium in, in which we're in. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that, Targad. And uh, again, like coming to entrepreneurship and you mentioned that passion and process cannot coexist. Like let's, let's deep dive into that. And like, you know, why did you think that? So I think you refer to the statement that, I, that I'm saying that to me at least when one of the biggest challenges when firms scale is, is balancing on one side, the passion of the core team, the founding team uh, with the need to institute processes to allow for a uh, scaling. And, and the reason I'm saying it, it's, it's, it's very hard to coexist is that there is, an, there is, a, there is magic in uh, this, the initial time when, the, when you start your firm, mm -hmm. where you can do whatever you want. Uh, if you had more time, you would do even more. And then when you say you can do whatever you want, it, it, there, it's a double-edged sword because you can do whatever you want, but and if you do things great, you get immediate feedback, your customer loves you, and, and this, you get emails from students that they love the product. And if you fail and you miss, you immediately hear that as well. Like the moment after a bug, a, or, or a crash, you immediately hear that as well. It's a roller coaster. Um, to create separation between a, every single decision in the market, you're creating processes, process to launch another feature, process to add another school, process to communicate. Now you need to see who else spoke with that person. I mean, and, and what these things do is that they slow you down. Uh, you need them, but they slow you down. Uh, Keith Raboy says that every firm is a competition between two processes, between the initial inertia of the initial core group and, and the sheer innovation that comes from the initial effort and the gravity of, of human complexity. And processes are, are, are trying to, are, are on one side, try to reduce complexity and good processes reduce complexity, but also processes add complexity. And, and so I, I think life is about the competition between these two. And, and then to be honest, working myself, being a founder myself, I find myself much more comfortable in an early stage firm where there is this freedom and, and this sense of control. And I enjoy less places where I need to set processes. That's true also for my team um, as, as, as being the head of the management technology program at, at Wharton and Penn. Uh, my team knows I, I, I don't like to micromanage. I actually like to have a very flat organization where every person is taking responsibility. And rather than me telling, if I need to tell them what to do, I, I could do it myself. I, I prefer that they will have the ability to do things themselves. I, I probably have less control than by dictating everything, but I think we get better outcomes. We get the lining of incentives. We have people get feedback on what they do, but these things don't scale all that well. I think that's a great point, Gad. Uh, and it's not just in startups and even like you no know, big, larger organization, it's the same problem. Like we have this ton of processes that we need to go through in order to make this simple change that makes the customer experience very good, right? So what are some of the things that you have seen over the years, like especially even in, in large corporations that like you know, this system of like, you know, yes, it's a big ship, but sometimes this process makes it good and bad as well. So startups are disrupting in that area. Hey, like we saw that problem and startups are innovating and disrupting. So what do you 
think like these large organizations can do in order to help themselves? Yeah, so, so you have a, a organizations like Amazon that has this notion of two pizza trays. Basically, the idea is that no team should be bigger than what can be fed by two pizza trays. Um, and basically what you're saying, innovation cannot scale, or at least cannot be done at big scale. So you need to have many, many small teams. It's okay to have redundancy. And um, that will, over time, will generate a, a innovation. You have a similar idea, a, but different implementation at Apple. Apple had, Steve Jobs at least, had this mentality of management by chaos, where for the first two years, essentially, you were not allowed to ask any questions. You were supposed to just do things by yourself and figure out things by yourself. Clearly very inefficient, but this chaos, actually, the people that survived that chaos actually were people that were innovators, were people that were willing to push the envelope, were people that were very independent and overall very innovative. You have, at the same time, Google. Google, you know, Eric Schmidt tell, tells a story when they put him to, when he brought him to be the CEO, they put him in a room with someone who was just like one more software developer. And, and, and Google very, very much coming from a, where Sager Brin and Larry Page came from a university type of environment. And, and they wanted Google to be like a university, very flat. And, and it worked well for many years at Google, not anymore probably, but it, like you can see founders that bring these ideas of how to maintain that nimbleness by making sure that the firm, that the processes are, are light and, and, and do not constrain those who want to innovate. Because if you constrain those who want to innovate, they will live, they will find a place to innovate. Thanks, Gad, uh, for sharing that insight. Now, again, coming into one of your favorite topics is the, the gig, gig economy. And like we are seeing a lot of things and a lot of shifts very recently. What are your thoughts, uh, especially in this whole supply and demand shift? So, you know, I, I think uh, the gig economy, uh, you know, just some of the names that come to mind will be, of course, Uber and Lyft, but also Teachers Pay, teachers pay Teachers and Coursera. A Coursera is probably slightly, not, not all of them are the same, right? Udemy is probably a better example for that. Um, and, and all of them are, are basically built on, on, on the following simple premise, which is in the past, we thought there is limited supply, supply of teachers, supply of cab drivers, supplies of hotels, supply of, of people that can fix things. That's not the case anymore. We realized there is actually unlimited supply and more of that because everybody's on their mobile and everybody's connecting to the network, we can find them and, and we can find the customers for them. And it doesn't matter where the customer is and it doesn't matter where the vendor or, or the teacher or the gig worker is. Um, and, and I see amazing opportunities with that. I think it, it uh, you know, I think we, we tend to look at Uber and Lyft and criticize for uh, the fact that these employees have no safety net and uh, the fact there is no uh, protection whatsoever for uh, illnesses and hours of work. And, and indeed, we, we need to develop that. We need to, to see how do we maintain these market conditions while also providing support uh, for these workers. But at the same time, if you're a teacher now in, in the middle of COVID-19 and, and, and you, you can teach kids wherever you want, uh, you can actually, if, I, if I'm interested in, my, in my, having my kids study uh, Esperanto, I'm sure that I can find a teacher who will teach them Esperanto. Right? I mean, like, just the limit, the, uh, I think the fact that there's really no more limits on, on finding and matching between supply and demand, that's just an, an amazing, uh, amazing thing. And, and, and I hope we'll find, develop the culture and develop the, the need, the, 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 sort of like the solutions for the, the more a, a political side of that, a political a social element of that, but I think the potential is immense. The potential is, 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 is I mean, to, to be able to really allow people to do what they're interested in doing and monetizing that and allowing people to really get, like I'll give an example, YouTube is not part of the gig economy, at least people don't consider that. But that became my go-to place for education. When I say go-to place, if I want to learn about Heidegger. I can read Heidegger and I read it later on, but I want, first of all, to watch a 20 minute video of a PhD student on this topic. And I can find 20 of these and I, and I get amazing survey. And I want to see how to assemble and to how to set up my camera. 
because now I'm on Zoom all day. So, I, so there are like 15 different videos on how to fine tune every aspect of the camera for to maximize that for Zoom. I mean, the, the amount of knowledge we find now, and th like in the past, there was really no way that I could find this or that. And so I, I think that the opportunities are just amazing. And uh, with that, like my next question to you is, yes, the opportunities are definitely great with, especially with technology, especially with mobile, uh, like you know, giving that opportunity for every everybody, uh, equal opportunity for everybody. And do you see any major shifts, especially in the higher education now that like we are seeing this gig economy coming and we don't see like a lot of programs are like you know, specifically targeting these students. Hey, like this is, this is booming and this this area is booming and like let's let's move fast let's help people get this skilled uh, because yeah. like that is the difference so what's what's your thoughts on that cat i don't see that yet in higher education that's correct um but we do see more of that in k12 mm -hmm. right primarily now with covid you see there are several schools like from out school to primer to a few others that are offering essentially a gigified version of homeschooling, mm -hmm. where you're creating a pod with a few neighbors and, and the teachers are coming based through like a net, through like a, a platform kind of system. Um, you see some of that in the more uh, skilled labor. And so there is a firm called Lambda School. It's not really gig economy type, it's still, but it's online education done by people not educated, educated in university, but they're not, no one gets a degree there. And, and I, you, you see, at least for skills, and a computer scientist, you know, it may sound like someone needs a, a graduate degree, and you need, a, to be a computer scientist, you need, indeed need a degree, but to be a software developer, like a, for mobile or, or, or for web, it's not clear that you need a degree. Um, if, if that's what you look for the short term, for long term is a different story. I think for long term, you think you do need a degree, but that's a different question. And, and the thing, but the point is that, that until it gets to our head, I think there are many, many other layers that are important and, and are feasible to, to have a more of a gig version until we get to university. University actually has so many different jobs that I'm not sure that gig is the right necessarily market for that. Mm, absolutely. I think uh, you're right, like, because this is a major shift and people talk a lot about like, you not know, the tuition debt and like, you not know, the student debt that is increasing every year. And we are seeing like a lot of people saying that, hey, like, why do I need to go to college when I get a, a computer science uh, knowledge just by learning e-learning uh, e courses? And that's where we have these mocks and like, you know, all these great online courses that are coming. So some of the universities are testing like different programs and different initiatives. Like from your experience, what do you think is one of the, one of the, the things that, that's coming out of all these different uh, initiatives that you're seeing? So I like you know a, a big initiative that happened a few years ago was a to you work with many universities to to make their a, a degrees online, a, and 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 that by now the many universities are doing it internally or not. But they actually had an interesting a, a idea that ultimately didn't pan out, a, but I thought it was very interesting. What they said, well, we'll move the course online, but we would like to be able to share the course across universities, primarily for courses that don't have enough enrollment in your university. So think about like, you know, Spanish level five. Not so many universities offer Spanish level five or Portuguese level three, right? I mean, like there are very few universities that have the capacity to do that. Why don't we offer a course that is shared? And it was a, a, a group of universities that I was then part of that exam that was Northwestern and, and, and I remember a, a Duke was part of that and a few others and said, so well, we'll create it. But the point, and, and then once it's online, then the teacher doesn't have to be anymore a, a, a Duke faculty or an Northwestern faculty. It can actually be sitting in Vermont and teaching. Um, and I thought it was a great idea, uh, but there was a lot of resistance from faculty. Because yeah. faculty also care, many faculty view their job, not only as a job, but actually as a mission. So A, we don't actually like the idea that there is only one right answer. I mean, we believe that we should teach it. Not, notice that very few times we actually dictate to exactly the faculty what to teach. And so some people say that's academic freedom and, and a, 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 of course, to, to affect that. But I would say that as a, as a university, we have, a, as faculty, we have every possible interest in, in not trying to force people to, to give one right answer. And sometimes, yes, one plus one should be two. 
but there is value in, in having a, a pluralistic approach towards that. And, and online actually is like, at least when you try to bring it, uh, like at least when you try to have one faculty teaching everybody, I think definitely is, goes against that. So faculty were against that. Um, I think we see a lot of, I, I, I think the delivery still remain pretty much the same, but I think after COVID we'll see more and more opportunities to think about hybrid. I think we have not find a way to do hybrid well. So basically what I'm saying is that I think the core, which is a faculty teaching a student, that's still going to remain, whether it is online or offline, I think in person, that's going to be seen. I'm not sure if that's kind of where I see the biggest innovations yet. The uh, degrees that move to be online, that's some innovation, but I, I see if you look at the content and the pedagogy, most of that remains essentially the same. Hmm. And uh, coming to the next topic, and uh, I recently read your article on uh, cloud kitchens. So that is mm -hmm. something that you have been like you now uh, following and like you now seeing the new trends. Like, what are some new insights that you have that you can share with our audience uh, regarding this area? Yeah. So cloud kitchens, just to explain, it's the notion that if anyway you are ordering food, why would why should the food be prepared in in a restaurant that is also hosting people? What's the benefit of that? Right, so, so, Travis, so the term, I'm not sure who coined the term, but people use different terms. Uh, Travis Kalanick, that was the uh, founder of Uber as a VC firm and, uh, that calls Cloud Kitchen. Uh, I think in the UK, some people call it Ghost Kitchens, Dark Kitchens, there are different names for that. Um, the main advantage is clear, right? I mean, a, a, a restaurant that has a storefront and seats, uh, when you buy a meal, the price of a meal accounts for is a bundle of all these services. It's a social gathering, so it's a small physical social network. It's entertainment, so the waiter is not only serving you food, he's also entertaining you. It's about food preparation. It's about reducing the cost for you of sitting at home, preparing the food and then cleaning the dishes. So, and all of that is into the price of the meal. What if I now you don't have, actually I create like cloud, I create a place where you can actually make, it's one kitchen, you can make whatever you want or the restaurant can make, whatever they want. They will have five different names. One name for their Greek menu, one name for their Israeli menu, one name for their Tibetan menu. And when you order, all of that's going to be made in the same kitchen. The main advantage is now that I can reduce the cost of the meal because I don't have to pay for real estate. I don't have to pay for, I mean, much more smaller real estate, because it has to add, can be tucked into an area that's at least less expensive of the city rather than a, a, at the main street. I don't have to pay for seats. I don't have to pay for the waiters. I don't, I mean, I can pay only for the food. So you get better food, less waste. And I can actually with the same kitchen, I can actually manage risk better because I can go with the ebbs and flows of whatever is hot today. So if today Greek food goes well, I'll, I'll, everybody will make Greek food. If tomorrow Israeli food goes better, will the same people are going to make Israeli food. I can, I, a little bit like Amazon cloud. I don't need to commit to where this capacity goes. So I think there is huge promise there. I think the only issue that it actually goes a little bit slower. So in my a, a, a newsletter, I wrote about three firms. I wrote about Robin Food. It's it's a it's a chain in Colombia that's trying to do a, a something equivalent to like automats, smart fridges, a, that they a, a do these are fresher and and cheaper. So it's like two dollars a meal a, through basically building that everything, making the food in in a cloud kitchen and then distribute it to these fridges. Every table, which is an LA based firm, does pretty much the same of grab and go, centralizing everything, but then distributing that into different locations in LA. And I wrote about a, a, a new collaboration between Kroger and a firm called a cluster truck that again, centralizes kitchens and actually has eight different menus in the same kitchen. A, all of these cheaper, fresher, faster. I think over time, we will still go to restaurants, don't get me wrong, but when we go to a restaurant, we'll, we'll know that we are, this is actually now, I, I'm paying for the entertainment and that's and it's great. We all want to have entertainment. We all want to have social network where we can actually go and meet people, but we sometimes just want to eat, in which case I don't want to pay for all of these things. That's a great concept, isn't it, uh, Gad? Like, no, not very long ago. I mean, yes, of course, we all love to go to restaurants, but uh, like, no, especially with how things are changing in the world, right. especially in this virtual world, I think uh, even like you know, the cloud kitchens are going to like you know, disrupt a lot of things in the coming years. And uh, thanks for sharing that in, uh, insight. And now, again, coming to the startup uh, side of things, 
what advice do you give especially with like you know how covid has come into our lives like you know unexpectedly what would you tell somebody who is thinking of an idea or just wanting to test an idea or an insight that the, that they are super passionate about like how do you like what do you tell them to get off, get it off the ground just do it <laughs> i it's just like nike no seriously i think the the world is divided into two types of people i'm i'm over simplifying those who are proud of who they are and those who are proud of what they've done a mm-hmm. i'll call i call them I, i don't think it's my term the doer the beers and the doers um, and you'll be surprised how many how, many, how very few people actually do things mm-hmm. most people talk about things and like to criticize other people but very few people do mm-hmm. and you know the, the, i i mentioned the simulation i built earlier the, the first simulation was built in a very simple we had a website but essentially it was like two a a a rubrics that we every time people left numbers there we took them and we computed things on the back end in matlab code it was the most rudimentary a, a game ever developed but we did it and then once we realized people use it we actually went to developers and asked them to develop that in scale and in fortran as well we we had very basic code initially and, and then we went and recruited the cto and so there is just a very high premium on just doing something putting in front of customers something there is such a high learning from just doing something so my recommendation you have an idea just do it wow. don't wait don't wait for other people don't recruit people don't think about how do you raise money just do it and if it works you'll scale it and then you can start thinking about what is the idea but just first of all do it and uh, you're absolutely right gad because uh, like you know i always share my experience with uh, like you know my own friends and colleagues saying that hey like you know what like i was just thinking of an idea like don't don't really know how to get it off the ground i just like talk to every other person who would just listen to me saying that hey like you know what do you think about this and sometimes as founders or entrepreneurs we had this problem of hey like i don't want to share my idea with anybody but the thing is like nobody is going to take your idea because like now ultimately it's all about the execution and now you have seen so many students especially from the management and technology program where like you know you're the director and you see a lot of students like you know working on these great ideas like what are what are your favorite stories especially from your uh, students that you have seen over the years so you know I'm the director of, of the program uh, only for four years uh, and i don't I prefer not to share a, a, a personal st- a stories of students, um, but I think what you see there is exactly what I mentioned, which is very, very strong bias towards action. Mm-hmm. A, a people that, when they have an idea, will just go and build it and come back the next day and they build it, and the next day they test it with someone, and and just being relentless uh, with with pushing things, uh, and and so I, I would say that's probably the main characteristic of many of these students, which is really erring on the side of of doing. wow so thanks for sharing that advice for all the students who are thinking about uh, starting their own startup scat and what advice like you now my final question to you is what advice do you give to yourself if you like you know look back in your 20s with everything that you know now yeah so that's actually a good question i, I don't think I, i i ever had the plan and i don't think in i i i don't think too much on on having a plan on things actually to me at least Uh, the, the way i think about it is that our actions are are better revelation of who we are than what we say mm-hmm. and so the, the in in many ways that's you know an ardent her sort of theory of of meaning is we first of all do and then we look for a narrative and we, cre- we use language to create meaning to what we did mm-hmm. and in many ways that's the way i behave that I, i when i find an interesting project i pursue that when i find an interesting research project i'll pursue that and ultimately late on when i look at that well, there is actually a pl- it seems as if there is a plan here but there was really never a plan it was always just getting excited by things and it's always the same thing things that that have on one side a a rigorous so go deep and really try to understand things but at the same time things that i think have impact on other people so i think the to me at least it's it's rather than looking for a, a mega plan or a master plan it's more about just again do things and look for a meaning later on the the meaning is in the action rather than in 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 trying to have a plan that is awesome uh, take away from this uh, show agar like thanks again uh, once again for coming on to the show and spending your valuable time and uh, i enjoyed talking to you uh, the most and like you know i always 
like you know see you as an entrepreneur as an, as, as an educator and you always have this great enthusiasm for sharing your knowledge to students which is super fascinating to me and uh, thanks for like you know for all the wonderful work that you are doing and is there anything that you would like to share like you know at the at the final thoughts no thanks for having me it's a great conversation thank you so much gad take care take care